Good afternoon. This is Paul DeLeo with the American Cleaning Institute. I'm delighted you're able to join us today for our webinar on aquatic environmental exposure assessment for formulated consumer products using iStream. The cleaning products industry has for decades fostered science and developed tools to better understand the potential impacts of cleaning product ingredients on the environment. Over the past four years, the American Cleaning Institute has been working with Waterborne Environmental to develop an aquatic environmental exposure model for formulated consumer products called iStream. I'm pleased to introduce Chris Holmes, a principal geospatial scientist at Waterborne with more than 20 years of experience evaluating sources, transport, and fate of chemicals in the environment. Chris will provide the bulk of our presentation, which should last about 40 minutes. And during that time, please feel free to submit your questions through the question box at the bottom of the toolbar, and we'll address them as time permits at the end. So we'll, we'll plan to end uh, right at the, the top of the hour, um, 3 o'clock. So Chris, with that, I'd like to turn things over to you. Thank you, Paul. appreciate that and uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you and, and the folks on the phone and appreciate your time uh, given to this. So just to get right into it and, and think about the things uh, that we'll talk about and, and really to, to try to understand where the model fits in, we'll talk uh, a little bit about just environmental risk assessment as a whole and, and then focus on the aquatic uh, compartment there in the environmental assessment uh, focusing on exposure. Uh, we'll then talk a little bit more about the components of iStream and some of the data that goes into the model and how it does its work and then look at uh, what you can get out of it and you as a user. And then ultimately uh, leveraging the, the output of iStream by linking it to other available data sets uh, that can be uh, directly linked to that, to that result. So really starting out is, is what is a risk assessment at a very broad level, but really it's, it's a process to aid decision making uh, on situations where we may have chemicals present uh, in the environment and uh, we want to determine if there's a concern. Uh, we need to know uh, what chemicals are present, uh, what levels uh, are in the environment and what levels are safe, uh, what, what uh, effects we might have for those organisms that are exposed to those chemicals. And really how likely are negative effects because we know based on, on monitoring programs and media and all the things that we've seen that, uh, that there are um, a number of chemicals in the environment. So it's, it's important to understand what the, the potential effects are. Um, and because we're talking about risk assessment, of course, risk is the probability of an adverse outcome. Uh, the presence doesn't necessarily mean an adverse outcome. Um, and a risk assessment is, is a quantitative approach. Um, it's something where we want to use quantitative input uh, to make an informed decision. In its simplest form, a risk assessment has five main components, uh, starting out with the data collection needed to uh, uh, inform the other uh, pieces here, the hazard assessment and the dose response assessment, uh, sometimes grouped together as an effects assessment, uh, provide information on, on chemical concentrations and, and responses in organisms. The exposure assessment, which provides uh, environmental concentrations to uh, be able to link to that effects assessment and ultimately the risk characterization, which is really the intersection then of the uh, effects and the exposure. And again, we're going to focus on the uh, exposure side. Um, however, the risk uh, assessment itself, uh, we just talked about a few components. This is a nice figure that really shows you some of the other components that fit into the broader risk assessment. Uh, we're not going to go into those today, uh, but just to kind of uh, pique your interest, you can start looking into that if that's something that you're uh, interested in. To quantify risk, um, and as we said, that's the probability of adverse outcomes, we compare the exposure level to a, a safety uh, level, uh, which is an effect level, um, and that gives us a risk ratio, or a, a sometimes known as a hazard quotient or a risk quotient, um, and that, that relationship between the exposure and the uh, effects level, um, or the safety level, uh, is, is an indication of uh, potential risk. Now a safety level is generally de derived from an effects level which is uh, generally driven from laboratory studies on, on uh, uh, test organisms, uh, including uh, then a safety factor uh, to account for uh, uncertainty or variability uh, within the assessment that perhaps we don't know and, and to continue to be uh, pro protective. Uh, 
the risk assessment process utilizes a tiered approach. Uh, and the advantage of a tiered approach really is allows us to focus on those situations that uh, uh, warrant the most uh, information and warrant the most attention. So lower tiers allow us to uh, allocate resources uh, to uh, those higher tiers uh, where that's most needed. Um, in the lower tiers, it requires less information, less data. Uh, it tends to be more conservative. Uh, but those conservative assumptions, uh, if we can readily screen out negligible risk, then again, we can focus on higher tiers. Now, failing a lower tier doesn't necessarily indicate risk uh, based on, the, on that tier. It just means that we need to move then to the next higher tier. And higher tiers incorporate more, more information, refine the process, uh, um, uh, which creates more uh, need for higher uh, and more data, of course, which increases costs and complexity. Thinking specifically about consumer products in the aquatic environment, uh, we can think about then what are some of the approaches and tools that we might use in an uh, aquatic exposure assessment. At the lower tier on the bottom, uh, typically these types of approaches use a, a single values and the, the end result may be a single value. Uh, for consumer products, of course, we're interested in the, in the national production volume or the usage uh, that's uh, being uh, used within the environment or dis discharged to the environment. So we may have a single value for that at a lower level. Uh, we may just have a single removal rate within a wastewater treatment plant and probably assume no dilution, again, to be conservative at a lower tier. Um, the tools that are involved in that tend to be fairly simple equations. Uh, and there are some uh, tools available, like the EFAS model, uh, that, that provide a very good starting point for an ecological exposure assessment. Moving up in tiers, we generate uh, or we need more detailed information. We might have regional usage rates uh, where we have variability across the country. Uh, and we might have variability in wastewater removal rates. Uh, in the US, we have a number of different treatment types. Uh, and we might look then at stream dilution as well, and variability within the environment. And there are tools that allow us to uh, identify potential uh, usage rates using market forensics and, and uh, survey product information, as well as uh, models that model the wastewater treatment plant process, and of course iStream, which then links that to a river network. And at the top end, where we get to be, have very detailed modeling and monitoring information uh, that gives us very site-specific uh, results um, that are, are, are focused in one, um, one area and answer specific questions. Uh, and those might be uh, watershed specific analyses and, and uh, tools are available for that level. iStream can be one of those. There are other watershed modeling tools available. Uh, the surface water assessment tool, the SWOT model is also one that incorporates diffuse source as well as point source. And typically, uh, you might end up having monitoring data either as uh, to supplement the exposure or to use as a validation step. Now the hope is, is as we increase in tiers that we're more closely approximating the actual concentration range that we see in the environment. And you can see that in the, uh, the lower blue bar. And as our uh, lower tiers have conservative assumptions, we tend to, and we want them to be on the upper end of that distribution at some point. Uh, and as we increase our uh, knowledge about the uh, exposure and, and the inputs that go into that, we can uh, improve our estimation of actual concentrations. Now the risk assessments can either produce a, a deterministic result or use a probabilistic approach. And as we talked about that ratio of the, uh, the, the toxic and exposure concentration to a reference value uh, produces a single number as a deterministic number. Um, and typically those uh, exposure numbers are, are generated from um, models. We often don't have monitoring data available, especially for widely used consumer products. Uh, and uh, toxicity is often determined from laboratory studies based on standard test species. And then uh, using some uh, margin of safety or safety factors generate a single uh, risk factor that's compared to that level of concern. Probabilistic approaches, on the other hand, incorporate natural variability as well as uncertainty uh, to try to better characterize the interaction of the important factors uh, within the environment. Um, and they can be used to refine uh, assumptions that were uh, utilized in lower tier assessments. 
And as we said, probabilistic assessments tend to uh, try to quantify or use uh, the variability and quantify the uncertainty. As we focus on exposure assessment, we need to think about a few things. Really, uh, typically, we'll use exposure scenarios. What are those specific conditions of exposure that we want to utilize, and what do they represent? Uh, in, from an environmental perspective, we want to understand what media are potentially exposed. Are we looking at freshwater, marine water, sediment, soil, uh, all those aspects that we need to address? Uh, how often do the organisms come into contact with, with the chemical of concern, and how long are they exposed? Uh, you know, the frequency might be due to exposure. We may have, have pulses or flows in, in the uh, water body, or we may have movement from the organism uh, in terms of uh, migration or, or uh, diurnal uh, patterns. And ultimately, we want to know what the magnitude of those concentrations are that they're being exposed to. So why do we want to focus on fresh water rather than um, uh, some of the other media? Well. The majority of releases for consumer products are disposed of down the drain. Um, that may be a direct disposal for something like a laundry detergent uh, or an indirect where we may have something that's uh, on clothing or uh, applied to the body that's then uh, ultimately uh, washed off. Um, that household usage is, is then uh, piped to a wastewater treatment plant where we have some level of treatment and generally that's discharged either to surface water or a septic system. If it's a surface water, uh, really the, the biota in those surface water environments is, is at the greatest risk to these consumer products um, from the effluent. Uh, we tend to have lower dilution factors in those, in those streams than we do in, in large water bodies and marine areas. Um, and we may not be able to have the ability for those organisms to, to move around in the smaller water bodies. So pictorially, we can see that we may have uh, a discharge from household wastewater that makes its way to municipal wastewater treatment plants uh, and then to surface waters. You know, clearly there are other avenues and um, mechanisms of transport to other media, um, but for consumer products, the, the main route of uh, transport is, is what we're showing here. So we're not really focused so much on a multimedia uh, fate model, which uh, there are models out there that do, but we're really focusing then on this one pathway. To calculate the exposure or the, the uh, predict the environmental concentration of the PEC, uh, we really look at the, the loading uh, divided by the dilution, the, uh, what's the, uh, the water volume. In a very simple sense, then, we can look at the, uh, the mass that's entering the system uh, on the numerator with some removal uh, in the wastewater treatment plant. To de determine the dilution, we can look at the per capita water use or wastewater generation per person uh, combined with the population served, and then uh, if there's a dilution factor involved during the discharge, uh, we can add that in. So it's a fairly straightforward equation. Uh, it's it's uh, very well used and used in a, in a, a number of models. Uh, just to note here that this is a, a generalized equation that uh, uh, units and, and um, uh, the temporal aspects wouldn't have to be normalized uh, before you do that. So this is the type of equation that's used in, uh, in the EFAST model. This is EPA's screening level model. Uh, it has a number of components, but it has a, a consumer product uh, discharge module. Uh, and it's a screening approach. It, it uh, applies a single national production volume that's provided by the user, as well as a removal rate within the facility. If we're looking at uh, ecological exposure for both acute and chronic, uh, it does use uh, uh, data from a distribution of dilution factors, um, and, but it picks a single value for either acute or chronic to then use in the uh, calculation of environmental, environmental concentration. The model itself is calculating that concentration in the mixing zone where the discharge is uh, it doesn't uh, allow for uh, downstream travel and, and looking at concentrations as we move downstream. Effluent concentration is determined by uh, the water use value and, and the production volume, and EFAS uses a mean water use value taken from uh, the Clean Watershed Needs Survey. Um, and uh, however, because we're looking just at the uh, each facility uh, or any facility, hypothetical facility, uh, uh, without looking at the broader environment, we're not considering the uh, upstream chemical con contribution in that environmental concentration. 
And the, the model does uh, have a probabilistic component looking at the probabilistic distribution uh, dilution model, the PDM. Um, and although that uses a distribution of inputs, it provides uh, a single deterministic value uh, as an output, which is the, the number of days a threshold is exceeded. So if you need to move to a higher tier tool for exposure, uh, iStream is one of the uh, possibilities. Um, it's a web-based tool, uh, models chemicals uh, that go down the drain, and that could be consumer products, but also could uh, relate to other uh, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, indoor use, pesticides, other, other chemicals. Um, one of the strengths is that concentrations are estimated at the discharge points, as we've talked about, using that, that uh, consistent uh, equation, but it models that at the individual facility level. So we've got over 13,000 wastewater treatment plants uh, within the model uh, based on the uh, Clean Watershed Needs Survey, which is an EPA data set that uh, is updated uh, periodically. Um, and that's linked to a river network of uh, over 240,000 river miles in the U.S. and, and parts of Canada. Uh, so by linking those facilities and the river network, we can now get a, a distribution or a, a, a range of values based on those uh, data sets, which are really the, the best available data sets uh, right now, especially at a national level. And clearly, as you know, the model then is supported uh, and made available to the public by the American Cleaning Institute. However, the model itself goes back uh, quite a ways into the, into the 1980s. The original algorithms were from EPA's water use improvement impairment model. And the Procter & Gamble company at that point uh, incorporated those uh, equations into a spreadsheet-based model called RAU. Uh, that was originally performed uh, and run on a mainframe environment. Uh, but later on, they converted that to a, a spatial uh, GIS-based approach uh, still within their intranet called GIS RAU. In 2010, uh, the GIS route was made available uh, to the public by American Cleaning Institute and rebranded as iStream and implemented and hosted uh, at the University of Cincinnati. A few years later, uh, by adding enhancements to the underlying data, uh, the user interface and, and output, uh, the model was moved to a new, new server hosted by Waterborne. And a uh, new domain was created, uh, iStream.org, and anyone can access the model through that uh, domain. Uh, what we're most excited about, of course, is this year we've released uh, a new version, uh, which includes upgrades to the underlying facility information uh, and the algorithms, but primarily uh, it's now based on a foundation of the National Hydrography uh, data set, NHD+. Uh, and the reason that's important is this is a, uh, an important data set that is the foundation for many public data sets and programs. Uh, it's a joint project uh, by the US EPA and the USGS. Uh, it's a very comprehensive data set. It covers the uh, conterminous US with about two and a half million stream segments, uh, as well as their associated drainage areas. Uh, so it's a very comprehensive data set. And as I said, a number of the programs you're very familiar with, uh, the NPDES uh, system, the Clean Watershed Needs Survey, uh, the Clean Water Act Impaired Water Listing, the 303D listings. Uh, there are a number of programs that are also using this NHD Plus as the framework. And what this allows is that we can then link the iStream output directly to these other programs and the information within those. Uh, just to give you an idea, and I, I believe the uh, this, uh, this will be available later. I've put some hyperlinks in here if you want to learn more. Uh, there's uh, 50 or so applications on the EPA website that are using the NHD Plus. Um, so, so you can go and take a look at that. Now using the model itself, uh, it's quite easy. It's, it's all done through a web browser uh, for entering your information, visualization, um, and working with your results. Um, you can download results and spatial data and uh, you can then uh, incorporate and, and work with that on your desktop uh, for visualization. Uh, there's no software needed to be installed on your machine to run the model because it's all done through a web interface. And the model runs themselves or performed on the server uh, and stored for you to come back later and work with them. So there's no impact to your, uh, your machine itself. And I know in some organizations it's very difficult to install software uh, on, the, uh, on locally. So this provides a way uh, for the public to have access to this without uh, the need for individual software installation. 
So we know that consumer products are, are widely used. There's a high, high volume. So it's, it's important that we have the capability to uh, perform a, a, a risk assessment for these types of uh, chemicals that are used either re regionally and nationally. Um, and the model itself is, is designed to incorporate information about uh, treatment plants um, linked to those river segments and producing concentrations at each one of those discharge locations and all the downstream river segments, as well as drinking water intakes. It incorporates a mean and a low flow scenario uh, regime. Working with the output allows you to look at distributions, uh, not just single data points, and uh, provides you the ability to make quantitative decisions on how to use the results. And it's, it's commonly a next step after a screening level exposure assessment. So what does iStream do? Well, uh, we have influence to the wastewater treatment plant. In each facility, each wastewater treatment plant is unique within that clean watershed needs survey. Uh, it has a uh, population served, and that's combined with the per capita usage that the user is providing. Um, there's some removal in that wastewater treatment plant, and iStream provides six different types of removal uh, or treatment regimes, and therefore six different removal rates if you uh, so have that information. And again, that's coming from the Clean Watershed Needs Survey. Ultimately, the effluent is discharged to surface water. Uh, we calculate the effluent concentration, and then that's linked to that NHD plus segment that has a flow. That's either a mean annual flow or a 7Q10 low flow, uh, and calculates the uh, river, the environmental concentration at that discharge location. Uh, we call that the mixing zone. That's then moved, uh, transmitted through the hydrologic network, um, and uh, the stream segments have a, have a flow velocity, uh, and, and therefore time of travel can be calculated. And uh, a loss within each segment, approximated by first order decay, can be incorporated to account for losses out of the water column, and that may be uh, accounting for by degradation, absorption, deposition. And that, that first order loss rate is provided by the user. As it's moving downstream, we have other inputs. We may have other wastewater treatment plants. We may have tributaries that are contributing uh, water and chemical from upstream wastewater treatment plants. Or we may have tributaries that are just pr providing water as a dilution. Um, within the system, there are uh, drinking water in, uh, abstraction points. And those calculations are, calcu are provided for each one of those intake locations if a uh, human uh, environmental exposure assessment is something that's of interest. But ultimately, we're calculating the surface water concentration for all effluent impacted streams. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, those are all the stream segments that are below a wastewater treatment plant. And while the NHD Plus data set contains about 2.5 million uh, stream segments, uh, there are only about 230,000 of those are below uh, a wastewater treatment plant, and that's the subset that's included within the model. So if we go back to that uh, PET calculation now and think about what does iStream provide uh, as the next uh, as a next step and uh, value added to this this calculation, um, the quantity of the substance used can have uh, regional variability, so it allows for market region uh, inputs where you may have information about uh, uh, different uses across the country. We have different uh, uh, removal rates for six different wastewater technologies, treatment technologies. Both the wastewater, the per capita water uh, generation and the population served are facility specific. They come from that clean watershed needs survey. Um, and while those aren't provided by the user, they address the variability that we find in the real environment. And ultimately, when those discharges are linked to surface water, we have a dilution factor uh, that's specific to that site, um, either in a mean flow situation or a low flow situation. So ultimately, we're calculating tens or hundreds of thousands of concentrations uh, in those receding streams, uh, which also includes the impact of the, the upstream discharges. So these are all connected together in the network. What does this look like as a user of the, the iStream interface? And here's an example uh, where you can see the market regions of the different, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, different river basins, uh, different geographies. We can run for the United States, for parts of Canada, 
uh, or for different uh, river basins within the U.S. There's a focus. This allows you to enter different removal rates for the different wastewater treatment technologies. We can enter that first order, <coughs> excuse me, first order decay rate um, for the in-stream removal. And it's important to note that this is looking at the water column concentration. So removal uh, from that water column concentration can uh, come from a number of different processes. The user can select either the mean or the low flow regime. And then the market regions for uh, regional use rates or loadings, um, if that information is available. And these market regions are aligned with um, the uh, typical um, survey information that you might find from companies collecting uh, consumer product survey information. To try to put some of the uh, input data into perspective uh, with uh, uh, a deterministic model, iStream, if we look at the um, underlying uh, data in the Clean Watershed Needs Survey, each facility has a flow and a population served. And if we, uh, using those two values, we can estimate the per capita water use, the amount of water use by the individual, assuming that the effluent flow is equivalent to the influent. Um, so the chart on the bottom shows you that distribution of dilution factors, I'm sorry, uh, per capita water use, uh, weighted by the population. Um, so you can see where the, the mean value that, that's used in EFAST falls somewhere about in the middle of that range. Uh, but the value here is within iStream in arid areas where you have uh, perhaps lower water use. Um, that information is being captured in the model itself, in the model run. We often think about effluent uh, uh, being a constant concentration, constant discharge from wastewater facilities because we, we think of uh, 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 the per capita use rate and, and consistency there. However, uh, because each facility has a different per capita water use rate, um, the effluent concentration varies um, and despite a constant use rate per person. Um, so that's influenced, of course, by the variable water weight rate that we just looked at as well as the potential for different treatment types. So you can see here in the chart then that while uh, we have a, a range of effluent concentrations, uh, this is for a US run, um, that provides again looking at more realistic information based on that clean watershed needs data. Once we link that effluent to a receiving water body, uh, we can look at uh, the dilution factor based on the uh, facility effluent flow and compare that to the receiving water body flow um, and determine what the dilution factor is at that particular site for that facility. Uh, the chart here shows the uh, mean flow and the low flow distributions for dilution factor um, across a little over 13,000 facilities. Um, so again, trying to approximate the, the uh, actual distribution of these values as they're used in the exposure assessment. So as a user, what do you need to bring to run the model? Uh, we have to decide on what geographic extent we, we want to run, uh, what that per capita loading rate is, and that may be um, determined through a, a total annual tonnage and, and population, or it may be determined uh, through other uh, sales information that, that may be available to look at the amount used per person. We have to enter the wastewater removal uh, for the six different types. Uh, and in, in river decay rate, if we know that, and uh, again, there are ways to determine that depending on the uh, characteristics of the compound. And select either the mean or low flow regime and provide some information about the simulation that then is used uh, as uh, it's stored on the server. Once the model is run, uh, you can log in and, and check your results. The, the panel on the left here shows a number of different model runs. By selecting one and clicking the uh, lowest button, the load charts for run, we can visualize some of the results then uh, from that model run. You'll note on the left-hand panel uh, there, the model run parameters are saved with each model run, so we know exactly what, uh, what parameters were used. Um, and the tabs along the top that may be difficult to read, but we can look at distributions of uh, the uh, entire set of river results, uh, the mixing zone results, uh, or the wastewater treatment plant effluent, uh, as well as the drinking water intake abstraction points uh, as a subset of concentrations. 
we do hope to continue to pro provide more robust visualization tools online um, to be able to allow you to break this down by region and, and, and other aspects. But you don't have to just work with the data online. You can download the data and work with it on your desktop. Uh, within that panel, if you expand this, an individual run, you can see that the uh, input parameters and the output results are available in Excel format. Uh, so you can download those and work with those in your in, uh, in your favorite uh, software. Although keep in mind that the the river uh, output file contains about 228,000 features or rows. Um, but the Excel files also include a, a sheet with the field descriptions to help you, um, and they do have a charting macro embedded that will allow uh, you to automatically create a few distribution charts. Um, so if you do download uh, one of those Excel files, note that it may give you a warning that there's a macro uh, and you don't have to uh, use the macro. As we said, the iStream results also are all spatially located. Uh, they all have a location. Um, the spatial data is available in uh, an access database. Actually, it's a, an ArcGIS um, geodatabase, uh, as well as uh, map documents that are already pre-linked to that data can be downloaded at the same time. Those map documents can be used in ArcGIS, uh, which is from the uh, uh, ESRI, although that's a product you, you have to pay for. However, ArcReader, also from ESRI and QGIS, are both uh, uh, pr freely available software uh, that you can, you can download to then visualize and manipulate uh, the spatial data. And that spatial data includes the entire river network and the wastewater treatment plant locations and the attributes associated with those. So it's a comprehensive uh, ability to work with the output. Um, you're not just getting a set of numbers, but you can look into the factors that went into generating those numbers for each one of those stream segments. That's a lot on the model itself, and, and uh, we're, we're quite proud of it. Um, there are a number of examples of how the model has been used in, in risk assessment or in other aspects of exposure assessment. Uh, in this one particular example, uh, we were looking at the uh, fragrance HHCB uh, and ran a national model using iStream. And looking at the final uh, full river set of dis distribution of concentrations or packs and looking at the 90th centile, we could then compare that to some uh, toxicity benchmark. Uh, to determine if there's a concern for risk. Um, that benchmark uh, was, uh, EPA's benchmark was taken from uh, the uh, work plan, Tosca work plan. And ultimately, if we look at that chronic concentration of concern of 9.7 micrograms per liter, uh, if we're looking at the mean flow values for eye strain, they were almost two orders, the 90th centile value was almost two orders of magnitude greater than that concentration of concern. Uh, and the low flow value is about a factor of three. So what we can feel pretty comfortable about is that the, the concentrations that are predicted for U.S. rivers are well below that concentration level of concern for aquatic toxicity, uh, chronic. Um, and CAPO et al. did a, a, a process where comparing some of the monitoring data that were available through NACWA and other data sources uh, to some modeling results specifically for HHCB um, and which supported the, the uh, conservative nature of the eye stream concentration uh, estimation. And ultimately then the uh, result of that screening level risk assessment using eye stream was consistent with that conclusion uh, from the US EPA uh, docket, which found no aquatic risk. That's just one example. I, I did include a slide with some other um, references. There's uh, Aaron Senadal worked uh, with DEET and, and used eye stream as part of a risk assessment. Uh, Federally at all also used uh, iStream uh, as part of HHCB. And sometimes there are uh, other value within the model. You can use components of it. Uh, several authors have used the distribution of dilution factors uh, as a standalone distribution in a probabilistic approach, uh, combining that with a distribution of it, uh, environmental concentrations um, and effects to in a Monte Carlo type approach. But one of the things that we're really excited about um, the, with this new version that's, that's recently come out is the ability to extend the iStream output uh, to work with some of the other 
uh, program data that are available through USGS and US EPA and other, other aspects because the output is linked with that unique uh, identifier from the NHD plus data, which is also available in these other data sets. So for example, the uh, string cat database uh, from EPA, uh, right now it's about 500 different metrics for each one of those string segments uh, and the associated catchments within the US. And those metrics might be things like land cover information or uh, soil information, weather uh, that now has, includes uh, some biological information, biological um, uh, categories, um, and that's continued to be added to. So that's a, a by using by just using that one linkage, we now opened up the ability to to uh, bring in a whole host of other information. Uh, another example is the National Aquatic Resource Survey. And this is a uh, biotic uh, survey to look at the um, uh, conditions, the biological conditions of waters across the U.S., both rivers and, and streams, as well as lakes and, and wetlands. Um, and uh, it's a, a statistical uh, survey approach uh, where they've gone out and measured uh, a number of key indicators and provided that, again, with the uh, NHD plus uh, linkage uh, along with the um, extrapolations that they've made with that information. So now we can link in not just other potential exposure uh, categories that might come from stream cat, but also the biological conditions of surface waters across the U.S. quite readily. In fact, Hill et al. Um, just recently um, had a paper linking that linked these two data sets together uh, to map and predict the spatial variation of biotic conditions across the U.S. Uh, using the landscape factors in StreamCAD and using the data in NARS as, as uh, a validation. So uh, this kind of approach is gaining more, uh, more uh, popularity. So hopefully I've shown you some of the, uh, the exciting things you can do with the model. Um, clearly we feel that the model is, is uh, useful in uh, both promoting stewardship as well as regulatory compliance uh, for uh, manufacturers of formulated consumer products. Um, it provides some refined uh, exposure estimates uh, beyond a, a simple screening level uh, that can be used to conduct risk assessments. And we do feel that the, the, the nature of the model being publicly available on a website using uh, best available public data uh, and allowing users to download uh, not just the results but the, the uh, along with the information that went into the modeling uh, really exemplify some of that open access to modeling resources. That's, that's really important. Um, and as uh, we ended up, we, we are excited about utilizing that NHD Plus framework to uh, leverage other data sets out there and other programs that are going on. And, and uh, we feel that as we move into the future, there will be more and more opportunities to link iStream with other public data. And as I said, this uh, is a, a few publications that relate to the use of iStream, uh, focusing on risk, risk assessment or exposure assessment uh, that you can use as a, a reference. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I think we can open it up for questions now. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I'll remind folks there's a questions box uh, at the bottom of your um, toolbar where you can provide questions and remind folks that we are recording this presentation and we'll provide a link to the presentation and to the slides to all registered participants. Um, again, I'll just reiterate that iStream is sponsored by the American Cleaning Institute and is made freely available to the public. Uh, you can access the model by going to www.istream.org. So I'm not seeing any questions at this time, Chris. And that's fine. Um, I think we can end our presentation at this time. I'll thank everyone for joining us. Um, I think you can, uh, again, contact ACI through Darcy Fair, um, and we'd be happy to follow up with any additional questions. I do see one question. If I can get to, oh gosh. All right, let me see. Ah, here we go. Uh, okay, the question is, can you see the question, Chris? It says, EFAST has the ability to determine days of exceedance at individual wastewater treatment plants, indicating the ability to estimate 
uh, mixing, zone, mixing zone concentrations as a function of temporal changes in dilution as a function of changing stream flow. Do you foresee a future upgrade in I stream that includes predicting the probability of exceeding a given concentration on a national level? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and that, that is uh, one of the um, values that that um, probabilistic uh, PDM module within EFAST. Uh, because we're using the, uh, the, the data sources that, that come along with uh, NHD Plus, um, right now, uh, as, as I said, we're using either the mean annual flow or the 7Q10 low flow. Um, so the key to what uh, you're asking is the temporal nature of the flow information. And uh, while we can't get to uh, daily data uh, from the NHD, uh, what we do have is, is monthly uh, mean flows, and we have uh, in the plans for the future, hopefully, the ability to look at seasonal and monthly flows and concentrations. Um, so it's uh, it, it's toward that end, getting that daily exceedance, but it does give you um, a more uh, more temporal resolution. Thanks, Chris. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see. Gosh, hang on a second. I do see one um, at the very top. Um, yeah, I'm having trouble seeing the questions. Maybe if you if you can pick them up. Uh, uh, this question says, for removal efficiencies for wastewater treatment plants, are there default generic values provided? Um, so within the model, um, those values are not provided because those are specific to the, the chemical uh, that's being investigated. Uh, and so those values are uh, widely uh, could range wildly. Now there are other sources where that kind of information, uh, you know, ready biodegradation tests and others that are commonly uh, performed can provide some of that information uh, for wastewater removal. Yeah, that's a question we've gotten a lot and it's um, just obviously those data uh, for individual chemicals would be um, be challenging to sort of collect that and, and provide that so, so we really haven't it's just been something that's been beyond our capabilities to do. Okay. That appears to be all the questions we have at this time. Uh, well, thanks everyone again for joining us today. We really appreciate your participation and your time. Um, again, look for an email from us following up. I believe they probably be a, a quick survey on the webinar and then links to the presentation and slides. Thanks again. Have a good rest of the day and good rest of the week.